uh, I'm thrilled to finally be here. This is something that uh, Andrew and I have planned uh, for at least, I think, a, a year. Yep, right a year. And uh, last summer, uh, my wife and I had the privilege of coming up here while we were in Door County and touring this, this wonderful museum that you have. So I'm, uh, I'm really uh, honored to be one of the speakers. And uh, just a little bit of, uh, about me, as it, she mentioned, I'm uh, a former teacher and administrator. I uh, actually at one time taught uh, in Kiwani, which I'm sure all of you know who that is. And uh, after my retirement, looking to, uh, uh, to get involved in, to volunteering. Well, I'm interested in historic homes. So I got in touch with the uh, Paps Mansion and uh, learned all about it and have been a guide there for, I don't know, must be about eight years or so. But in addition, uh, along the way, I decided that uh, it would be fun to uh, develop a series of lectures, so getting out into the community, uh, talking about all things past. So I actually have five different uh, lectures, one of them which you'll be hearing uh, uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, let me uh, just uh, get started. So uh, again, really encourage you, if you get a chance to tour the Paps Mansion, it uh, was built for Frederick Paps and his wife, Maria, uh, finished in 1892 and has been very carefully restored, wonderfully restored. Well, uh, I volunteered there, but I also had the opportunity to volunteer on a sailing vessel, the uh, Dennis Sullivan. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It was built in Milwaukee uh, by many volunteers and experts, uh, launched in the year 2000, and it actually is a uh, replica of a uh, Great Lake schooner and would make daily trips uh, out past the breakwater onto the lake and allow the passengers to get a chance to uh, raise the sails and furl the sails and uh, so forth. And also um, uh, brought school groups on there. So uh, for two years, I volunteered on there uh, doing things like casting off and uh, as they sailed, say doing sail work as we tacked um, um, throwing the uh, heaving line as we docked, but also got a chance to uh, use my teaching uh, uh, talents or abilities because what they would do is have school groups uh, come on board and we divide them up into small groups. Here I have about uh, three or four. I see one of them is falling asleep. <laughs> uh, doesn't say much about me, does it? And uh, they would uh, do different stations around the, around the boat as it was uh, out on, on the lake. And uh, what I did was invasive species and uh, plankton, uh, plankton and also water, water quality. So that was very, uh, very much fun for me. You might wonder about the name Dennis Sullivan. Well, uh, actually there was a ship called the Moonlight, which was uh, built in 1874 uh, and it uh, sailed uh, for um, almost 30 years on the Great Lakes. And guess what? The captain was Dennis Sullivan. So when they were deciding uh, what they wanted to name this uh, replica schooner, they chose a uh, former captain. Well, uh, the, the moonlight didn't uh, have a very good ending and eventually uh, uh, ended up being uh, 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 floundering on, uh, on shore here, as you can see. And that was kind of the end of it. And also, sadly, kind of the end of the Dennis Sullivan, because what happened was COVID struck and for many, many months, we had no people at all sailing on the boat. And yet, you know, a wooden ship requires constant maintenance. Scraping paint, painting, caulking. So we had to have a skeleton crew on board. We had to pay them. We also lost uh, much of our funding during that time for whatever reason. So very sadly, this last year, they removed the masts, and the Dennis Sullivan was, was motored to Boston Harbor, where it is now part of their World Ocean School. It'll be doing the same things, but in, but in Boston. So Milwaukee's, Wisconsin's lost, uh, Boston's gain, I guess. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, at, uh, at that great replica just uh, didn't stay here. Well, we're not talking about uh, me or uh, sailboats tonight, we're talking about Frederick Paps, right? Now, when most people uh, hear Paps, they think of the beer he brewed. These were the various beers uh, he brewed during his lifetime. 
and were brewed uh, well into the future. You see the uh, one, uh, one from the left has a blue ribbon. His select beer was called Pat's Blue Ribbon Beer. And the ribbon had everything to do with advertising. When you were about to buy beer, only that beer had a blue ribbon on it. He said, well, gosh, blue ribbon means first place. Like grandma's uh, apple pie at the state fair, I'm going to buy that beer. And they did. And, uh, and they loved it. But I guess tonight we're more uh, looking at uh, this. I hope you all had a chance to get a PBR. It'll help the lecture, believe me. <laughs> Well, this is a story about a boy who was born in Saxony, Germany in 1836. His parents were Gottlieb and Frederica. He had a brother and sister as well. Um, Germany, until about 1871, when it was united, was really only uh, a country in your mind. And in the 1840s, a lot of terrible things were happening in Germany. There was political unrest, economic issues. There were, had been a terrible drought. The taxes were high. A lot of people were immigrating to America in the 1840s. And guess what? Uh, Frederick, uh, perhaps uh, parents decided to take Frederick there as well. So he was born in actually uh, Thuringia, uh, a region uh, near Saxony. And if you look at the map, uh, do you see that Thuringia is on any great lakes or oceans or rivers? Actually, the Elbe River is just uh, north and east of it. Now, guess what? Frederick Paps grew up far from water. And yet we're talking tonight about Frederick Paps as a mariner. How on earth did that happen? This is a painting from the Paps Mansion called Plowing in Saxony. Guess what? Saxony is very flat land. Lots of times when people think of Germany, they think of uh, skiing down the mountains and whatnot, but parts of Germany look, look just like Wisconsin. So uh, he really uh, grew up in the land that, uh, that he ended up living, living in. So uh, very, I'm sure he, he chose that uh, painting for the very reason reminded him of his homeland. So they boarded a boat in Hamburg and uh, sailed across in the Atlantic. Now that was a long journey, weeks and weeks of sailing. So you had a lot of time to contemplate life and to watch other people, I guess, but also the water. And young Frederick, age 12, was fascinated with the ocean. Let me read you a quote. During the long voyage, the boy Frederick had been in a constant state of delight and wonderment. The ocean voyage did more than any other experience of his early years to influence and shape his later career. The memory of the voyage of the ocean, quote, persisted in his mind. So he began to realize how much he loved being out in the water as he was crossing the ocean to America. Well, they arrived uh, in New York and eventually made their way to the Midwest, first to Milwaukee, but it wasn't to their liking. So they settled in Chicago. This is a picture of Chicago and its harbor. And within the first year, his mother, Frederica, sadly died of cholera. So his father, Gottlieb, and young Fred, they weren't skilled workers. They weren't brewers. They weren't sailors. They found work in restaurants. They cooked. They bust the tables. They wash the dishes. If you ever want to hear of a rags to riches story, look at Fred Pabst. From those very humble beginnings, he obviously became a famous through beer. We'll talk about some other things as well. So eventually, though, they came back to Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee has a, quite a nice harbor. And what benefits Milwaukee uh, are its, its rivers. Back in those days, uh, there was very little uh, uh, train traffic from rails uh, laid in the area. So you depended on the river. So we have coming from the, uh, the north, the Milwaukee River. We have from the east, the Menominee River. And, and uh, that's how the Menominee River Valley used to look. It was just swamp land. If you um, uh, 
followed through history and eventually became a great industrial center. And then from the south, you have the Kinnikinick River. And only people from Wisconsin can pronounce that name, by the way. <laughs> the Kinnikinick River. So uh, Milwaukee had a great port. Now, when Frederick had time, I'll call him Fred yet, he loved to go down to the harbor, of course, when he had free time. And he was fascinated with these long side wheeler steamboats. He started hanging around them. And uh, there was a, uh, a man by the name of Sam Ward. He was actually one of the first owners of steamboats on the Great Lakes. So he got to know Sam pretty well. Sam got to know Fred. And uh, before you knew it, uh, Sam said, hey, you know, you want to work on my boat? Maybe I could make you a, a mascot or maybe a, 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 some kind of just a, a worker, maybe a cabin boy or whatever. So I'm going to tell you a story that shows you at a very young age how honest, brutally honest, and determined uh, young Frederick was. Here's the story. Uh, one of the Fred Ward boats had docked in Milwaukee, and Fred told his crew, don't let anyone off this boat unless they have a ticket. They're not getting back on unless they have a ticket. You got that? Everybody said, okay. So young Fred Paps was stationed by the, by the uh, gangplank. And guess who comes along? Captain uh, Ford, uh, Ward himself wanting to get off. And I want to read you uh, something from an uh, uh, article actually from the Milwaukee Journal that describes this incident. And the writer of this article actually put dialect in here. So I'm going to try to, uh, you'll, you'll hopefully notice when Fred is speaking by the dialect. This is uh, an exact uh, reading from that article. It's called uh, When Captain Fred, uh, Unzer Fritz, Unzer means one of ours, one of ours, Fritz, uh, got his upward start. <clears throat> Here we go. I used to run on the lakes, remarked Jailer Roth yesterday, discussing the adventure of the steamer John A. Dix. That was way back in the 50s. Captain Paps was working on deck. In what capacity, inquired the journal representative. Oh, he swept the decks and helped handle freight and stood guard. He was a hardworking, faithful fellow. The first time he gained notoriety was in this way. E.B. Ward was one of the passengers. He was also the owner of the line. And when the boat reached Milwaukee, he started down the stairs for the purpose of going ashore. He was stopped at the foot of the stairs by Past, who demanded his ticket. Say, boy, I'll give you a quarter if you let me off, the captain said. Nine, I want their ticket. Oh, here's 50 cents. Nine, their ticket. Look, I'll give you a dollar. That's all the money I have. Nine. You should give me their ticket and then you go then shore out. Mr. Ward turned back, met the clerk in the cab, and inquired, who is that Dutch boy? <laughs> <laughs> that Dutch boy, why? That's one's their friends. Just raise his wages $10 a month, said the cab. So from that time on, Fritz Paps was in a line for promotion. He could hardly speak a word of English, but he impressed and soon became wheelsman, then second and first mate, and finally a captain. So already at that age, if you gave him an order, he was going to obey it no matter what. Stick to his guns, you might say. I want you to understand where his time as a mariner fits in his lifetime. So I made this, uh, this uh, timeline. So he was born in 1836. He arrived in America in 1848. He became a cabin boy in 1850, uh, eventually a captain in 1857. But look, he lived to be 67 years old. He died in 1904. So if you look at the time that Frederick Pabst was a mariner, 
was only about 14 years of his life. And yet those 14 years so influenced him in terms of uh, responsibility, of understanding shipping, of understanding commerce, even of learning how to manage people. It really was his school for all the other successes he had in life, quite an amazing thing. Now, I mentioned uh, Ward, but uh, a man named uh, Albert Goodrich really was the one who really got, uh, took uh, steam boating to another uh, level here on the Great Lakes. He had up to uh, 50 boats at one time on the Goodrich line. And it would not be uncommon to see those boats uh, lined up, you know, bow to stern in the, in the various harbors. Just a, a word about uh, the Goodrich line. This is from uh, the Kenosha Telegraph, May 1862. Goodrich, so long connected with steamboat business on Lake Michigan, the boats composing the line are handsome and staunch steamers. The former Captain Pasture commander is well known on this lake, as is his favorite craft. And comes out this uh, spring neat as a pin throughout. So uh, the point here is the Goodrich boats were were really classy boats. They were they were well kept up. They had very nice accommodations uh, for the most part uh, for people, and they were the type of uh, line that people would choose if they had a choice. Just like if you're flying a, a airplane, uh, you know, pick a flight. Maybe there's a certain uh, airline you trust more or you, uh, you find more comfortable. Uh, what are their ads? And in this ad on the right hand side, you see that it's a side wheeler passenger steamer, Chicago to Racine to Milwaukee, it says. And uh, th this particular ad appeared in the same newspaper as did the uh, column uh, to the right of it. Uh, we call special attention uh, of our readers to the advertisement of Goodrich Steamboat Transportation Line in another column. We availed ourselves last summer, uh, a time of a pleasure of uh, water travel by this line and found it uh, all our fancy painted it. The boats are clean, large, and commodious. The meals, excellent. The hands, attentive and obedient. So high praise for the Goodrich Line, and, the, and it was Good rich ships that, uh, that Fred Pabst uh, uh, piloted the most. Uh, I read some more that he uh, was on 11 different uh, steamboats. Tonight, we're gonna focus on just uh, actually three of those. Another ad, in this ad, you see they're going from uh, Chicago to Racine to Milwaukee on the right-hand side, uh, all the way to Manitowoc. So they're slowly inching their way up the Western side of uh, Lake Michigan. Here's one of their docks. This one probably in Milwaukee because it's advertising fares to Chicago for $1. Uh, $1, it might seem cheap to us, uh, but uh, compared to today's uh, wages, not so. We'll talk more about that a little later. So by 1857, Frederick Paft had his pilot's license. Now on the right hand side, this is a document, uh, the actual pilot's license that we have in the, in the uh, Paps Mansion archives. Um, I actually got the touch with my own hands and you can see it signed by Fred Paps right down here. But this is a, a, a license renewal. He got his, his pilot's license in 1857. I believe this says down below here, 1860 or possibly 63. So I suspect that they had to get their licenses renewed on a regular basis, uh, simply because there was new technology and uh, new uh, navigational uh, ways and maybe uh, new maps and so forth uh, to uh, get acquainted with. So this is the Huron, one of the first boats I'm gonna talk about. And uh, it was, uh, as you can see, built in 1852. 
165 feet in length with a beam of uh, 23 feet. And uh, he captained it in 1859 and went from Milwaukee uh, to, to Rivers. It was pretty much uh, a, a, a very basic uh, steamer. It was not one of Goodrich's fanciest ones. It, it, it provided your basic needs, uh, but you had to bring your own food and bring, bring your own chair, or whatever, if you wanted to sit, sit down, and that sort of thing. But I was amazed in my research how many accidents these steamboats had. I mean, it reminded me of, of uh, cars, people that are accident prone, you know? So let me just uh, give you a couple of, uh, from the history of the, of the Hira. Uh, 1853, stuck, sunk an object, sunk and raised. So they brought it up, fixed it, put it back out on, the, on the water. 1857, Chicago Harbor, struck the wreck, uh, a wreck of a schooner, sunk and raised. 1859, Captain Pabst ran aground, trying a difficult docking in Milwaukee. And, uh, and then later on, it was uh, sunk a few more times and eventually sold in 1867. This um, talks about, I guess the main thing I want to point out is on the bottom, that they're going from Racine to Milwaukee, you now Port Washington, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, and uh, two rivers. So again, farther and farther up the uh, western uh, coast of, of uh, Lake Michigan. So, kind of started uh, there and just kept on going as far as Kiwani. I don't have any information that they got that he he uh, piloted any uh, steamboats farther than, uh, than two rivers. The Comet was perhaps his, his, his favorite boat, and it was often described as uh, the swiftest boat and the uh, most luxurious boat. And you can see it was uh, built in 18, uh, okay, let's see, 60, okay. And the Comet, um, was a boat then that people really uh, tried to uh, take if they were going along uh, the lake uh, north. Here's probably his, his business card, Steamer Comet, Captain F. Paps, we'll leave the Goodrich docks at eight o'clock Monday, Wednesday and Friday for Port Washington, Sheboygan, Manitowoc and Two Rivers. And, uh, That would be a boat you'd want to take. More praise from the Manitowoc pilot here. Captain Paps, everyone's favorite, is now commander of the Comet. Captain Paps and his body boat, as they describe it. And later on, she is uh, a neat, elegant, and comfortable craft and said to be the swiftest sailor on Lake Michigan. Now, she uh, could sail up to 15 miles an hour. Most uh, of the steamers I found were between eight and 10 miles per hour. So if you wanted uh, not only a really good ship and a really good captain and a, a fast ship, you would try to get on board the Comet. This is a marine, marine record from the Port of Milwaukee. You can see what uh, he carried. At the bottom, Captain Paps, two rivers, 24 sacks, rugs, 18 dozen chair stuff, 21 kegs of beer. So uh, I guess before he brewed beer, he was also carrying it. Uh, 2,105 bushels of wheat and 31 rolls of leather. So he carried materials and he carried passengers, but he also carried soldiers. Now, as you know, the Civil War began in April of uh, 1861, 
And uh, they had to, to transport these soldiers again before uh, there were a lot of good railroads in the country, get them out east where the war was taking place. So we know for a fact that the Comet uh, brought soldiers from Manitowoc through the Great Lakes to Cleveland, where they disembarked for the war. And in, in 1862, in Port Washington, there was a draft riot. Here's what was happening. The, if you were drafted for the Civil War and you were wealthy enough, you could actually pay somebody to be a soldier for you. So the wealthy often did not have to fight at all in the war. But of course, that left the uh, draft to the poor people. And they objected to this, and they started a riot. It caused quite a bit of havoc in Port Washington to the point where the governor called in the state militia. And he also then asked uh, uh, the Goodrich Line to send several of their steamboats up to Port Washington to bring back uh, the rioters, bring back the prisoners. And Captain Patrick definitely was part of that. Uh, they came back to the Port of Milwaukee and then took them overland to, uh, to Camp Randall in, in, in uh, Madison, which was once a fort before it became a great football stadium. <laughs> now, it's not unusual, uh, at least when there still were travel agents, I don't know if there still are or not, uh, not unusual for travel agents to actually take trips themselves so that they could uh, then in turn tech, talk to their customers about uh, how great the trip was and uh, what some of the uh, really great things were um, uh, that they might see. So this is a, uh, uh, from the Manitowoc pilot and uh, the editor of the Calumet Republican recently took a trip from this port to Milwaukee on the favorite steamer Comet, and thus expresses his opinion of the route, the boat and her gentlemanly officers. So the reporter talks about Captain Fred Paps as a great officer and so on. But then on the right-hand column, uh, the writer talks about the stewards and says basically that the stewards on board the Comet were much more kindly than uh, normal uh, oftentimes the stewards acted as though they owned the boat themselves and they were rude and they cussed and, uh, and just did nasty things, but not on board the Comet. As you'll read uh, uh, farther down, uh, the stewards were very gentlemanly. So this tells me not only was Frederick Paps a very, very skillful captain, skillful navigator, but he knew how to handle people. He knew how to manage people. He knew how to get them to, uh, to act properly. And that had to help him later on when he went into the business of, of brewing beer, right? Well, he met his wife on board the Comet. Her father, Philip, often went to Sheboygan because they had relatives in Sheboygan. And he also was following up on some of his business interests. So uh, they were often on board. And uh, the story is told, it might be uh, apocryphal, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna tell it anyway. That one time, uh, Maria was uh, walking on the gangplank and fell between the boat and the dock. And dashing young Captain Paps immediately I don't know if he took his shoes off first or not, but he dived in after her and pulled her onto the dock and saved her life. And this had to uh, enhance their uh, romantic relationship, right? <laughs> so they were married in 1862. Uh, and now he was still going to be a captain for two more years. But he now had an additional responsibility to himself. He had a responsibility to his wife to get home safely every night or every weekend or whatever the case may be. And he took that very seriously. And the Manitowoc pilot in 1862, we're told that a round trip ticket to Kiwani was $1.50. Now let's put that in today's value. It'd be about $45 today. Our round trip to Kiwani. When people made 
maybe $10 a week. So it was more than a week's salary to go on that trip. So you had to, had to have a very good business uh, reason to take that boat, or you would have had to save up a lot of money to uh, take a vacation maybe in uh, Sturgeon Bay uh, in those days because uh, $45 was well over a month's salary. So we think $1.50 is a good deal, not really. Okay, as we move on here, 1863, we see that they've extended trips now to Kiwani. And later on, uh, below it talks about first class, includes meals and births. Wow. Uh, compared to maybe if you take a, a train, transcontinental train out west, you know, you can opt for a little private cabin in addition to your normal seat on the train. So first class people got a meal served to them and actually a place in out of the rain, out of the uh, weather to sleep. Uh, what about the rest of the people? They were on deck. You brought your own lunch and maybe a sleeping bag if it was a longer trip or maybe you just sat on the deck or slept on the deck. So a huge difference between uh, first class. I wouldn't exactly call this steerage but uh, it was quite a difference. All right, uh, the next point I wanna talk about is the Sunbeam, built in 1859, and briefly uh, captained uh, uh, by Fred Pabst, just for a brief amount of time. And uh, it, was, it had uh, two decks, as you can see, the, the fore deck was for gentlemen. And the aft deck on the other side of the uh, of the uh, wheel was for ladies and for children. And speaking of those wheels, those wheels were gigantic. They might be between uh, 26, 28, 30 feet in diameter. You needed all that wheel and all that torque to uh, to make it uh, along uh, you know the the Great Lakes, uh, which can be very dangerous and very uh, challenging for sure. So uh, that was the Sunbeam. And uh, a couple of incidents that happened, uh, one in 1862, the engineer fell asleep uh, as they neared the pier off Portage, Michigan, on Lake Superior. Uh, the signal was given to stop the engine, but it was not obeyed until the boat ran upon the break. 29 people lost. 1863 could very well have been when, when Frederick Pabst was captain, lost man overboard. In 1868, that was long after he was uh, on the lake, but Waukegan caught on fire and burned, 72 li lives lost. So uh, traveling was, was kind of dangerous. There was always a danger of striking something, a sandbar or a uh, another sucking ship or ramming one, or of course, fire would be another uh, uh, real issue. Here, uh, we're told that uh, we're happy to hear that Fred Pabst, formerly master of the Sunbeam, now running in Chicago and Grand Haven, is uh, now commander of the new and splendid Steamer uh, Seabird. The Seabird was built in 1858 and uh, it had quite a life. Well, Captain Pabst was uh, on it one December in 1863, a uh, terrible storm came up. Well, before that, I'm sorry, I want to get to something else. There's a picture of the sleeve. I wanted to show you this bill of lading. This is from the, uh, the PAPS archives. And I know it's hard to read what is actually on here, but on the second page, I wanted to point out uh, and stress that in signing this, Fred PAPS was saying, I am totally responsible for everything on this steamboat, all the cargo all the passengers in the boat of getting it safely from one place to another. A huge responsibility for a man who can 
who was in his only in his 20s to have this huge responsibility. Here is a uh, ticket from the uh, Seabird. It's a return ticket, just a one-way ticket. And we're actually going to talk about a uh, time when that's all that the passengers actually needed. In 1863, in December, a storm came up. It was so severe. This was uh, just uh, between Chicago and uh, Milwaukee. So severe that um, they couldn't make it to shore. And in order to save the boat, he had to drive it right up onto the shores of Whitefish Bay. I want to read an article that's a rather lengthy one, but really descriptive of the, uh, this, this particular uh, incident. And as I do, hopefully this uh, painting will kind of illustrate what I'm, what I'm saying. So here we go. After passing Port Washington, the sea began to make breaches over the main deck, striking terror to the hearts of the passengers and causing some anxiety on the part of the officers and crew. This was about half past six and the sea was frequently dashing clear over the upper works and completely deluging the main deck. About a half an hour's run was made toward shore. In other words, they tried to go toward shore and the officers gazed out into the darkness with faint hopes of seeing the, a light, but in vain, they could not make the light at the mouth of the harbor or at the North Point. There's a, a lighthouse at North Point uh, in Milwaukee. One more effort is decided upon. The noble steamer obeys her helm and her prow points seaward now. Her engines are now crowded to their utmost capacity and she is kept head to the wind for another hour, but all in vain. So it didn't work to go toward shore. It didn't work to go back out into the lake. The storm was getting worse and worse and worse. The waves were rolling mountain high, crushing in the bulwarks, sweeping the decks, and at times fairly lifting the huge ship into the air, the next moment to bury it beneath the boiling waters. This was about half past seven, and Captain Pabst, finding the water was making in the hold, and but little hope remained of saving his staunch and noble steamer, turned her head once more toward the shore. A run of about half an hour brought her near North Point, and as she neared shoal water, the breakers swept over and around her with tremendous force, and she began to be unmanageable, swinging around in the troughs of the sea, and shortly after drifting on the beach, as we have described. Some of the passengers were perfectly paralyzed with fear, while others made preparations for launching themselves into the water as many advantages as possible in case they floundered or were driven on the beach. Fortunately, the steamer was so staunchly built as to hold together and all on board could remain with safety until the morning. Now here's the important part. The conduct of the officers under this trying, these trying circumstances reflects great credit upon them. And the passengers are unanimous in their praises of the captain, clerk, mates, and engineers. So he did the right thing by simply full steam ahead right up onto the shore uh, of uh, Whitefish Bay near, near Milwaukee. Now, of course, the boat was not usable and sat there for a while. Here's a newspaper account from 1864 May. So remember, it, uh, it uh, went ashore in December of 1863. Now it's May 1864. And uh, Captain Morgan, uh, the Comet, a ship that we're familiar with now, actually went back to the site of the uh, beaching and found that uh, the sand that had blown over the ship had somewhat washed away. And uh, the ship, the uh, Seabird, could be uh, pulled offshore and uh, uh, at least floated uh, far enough to have repairs done to it. So it wasn't a total disaster, believe it or not, after all that uh, uh, you know, crashing onto shore. 
But that was not, sadly, uh, it was not the end of the seabird. In 1868, a terrible fire. What happened was a porter was emptying out one of the, uh, the uh, uh, little furnaces they had in the wheelhouse, and he had some live coals and embers in a bucket. And uh, he walked to the deck and threw them into the wind, into the wind. <laughs> so as a result, the embers uh, blew back onto the deck, which had been newly varnished. And plus there was straw on the deck. And it was the middle of the night and the passengers were asleep. Most of the crew was asleep. The ship burned as terribly as this uh, painting illustrates. And over 100 lives were lost that night, either because they drowned, because they burned to death, or because they simply froze to death in the chilly waters. So the seabird had two uh, severe crashes, uh, one being uh, its final you know, ending. Hey, Dave, are these people jumping into the water? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yeah, they're actually jumping into the water because uh, of the fire. You know, they they said, oh, "What's what better chance do I have to be burned on deck or to jump into, uh, you know, the icy, icy waters of uh, uh, Lake Michigan?" Just like I think of uh, that, the Titanic, how those people uh, could only survive just so long in the water. Miss something here. Now, did Captain Paps ever get his fire stirs in May? Well, in a sense, he did. Because uh, as I toured your wonderful museum uh, last summer, you have some artifacts from uh, the uh, Erie L. Hat Hatley on display. And uh, those artifacts are these. That is a hammer that was used to pound the, the, the hogs in the uh, in the uh, beer barrels, <laughs> and uh, so obviously the Hackley was carrying beer at the time. But this was retrieved. Look at Paps Brewing Company, Milwaukee. So even though Frederick Paps might not physically have gotten as far as Turgeon Bay, at least his presence is here in that display. So uh, check it out. I don't know if you can still do it tonight. But next time, what, what floor is it on? The second floor. Be sure, sure to check out the display. Uh, that was really cool when I saw that. I thought, wow, that's really something. Well, we're still not done with ships, even though Frederick Paps in 1864 uh, decided to leave shipping and learn a new trade. Guess what? His father-in-law, Philip Best, owned the Philip Best Brewery. And he taught young Frederick how to brew beer literally from the barrel out, as they say. And did such a good job that uh, Philip then retired. And Frederick Paps took out, took out a partner named Emil Shandai at about his same age. And Emil suddenly died. So before he knew it, Fred Paps was the owner of the Best Brewery. Now think about this. He came to America penniless, earned some money uh, you know, working in restaurants, invested it in a steamboat, took that steamboat investment and invested it in stocks in the best brewing company. And of course, then grew the company. So he was a man, again, very, very uh, wise uh, beyond his years. But we're still not done with boats. This is a beautifully uh, hand-painted uh, photograph of Grand Avenue in Milwaukee. Today it's called Wisconsin Avenue, and it is indeed on Grand Avenue that we have the Pabst Mansion today, farther west down the street. But look over here in the corner, what do you see? It says Pabst. What? Whitefish, Whitefish Bay. Bay Resort. 
So you could uh, board this cute little steamer in the harbor. Here, I've done the picture of it. You can get quite a few people on there. Oh, yeah. And uh, take this cute little steamer uh, all the way up the shore to Whitefish Bay to a beautiful resort. This resort had a, a, a wonderful uh, restaurant. It had a hotel. It had a Ferris wheel. It had a bandstand. And it had these fabulous views of Lake Michigan. Look, you could walk down those uh, um, back and forth uh, uh, paths down to the lake. Wait a minute, Whitefish Bay? Did we just talk about Whitefish Bay a little while ago and beaching a, a craft there? Well, not far from this resort is where you actually beached uh, the seabird. So kind of coming back to uh, this past. So one of the things he invested is beer money in was real estate. The guy was always thinking and always uh, investing. Now, in 1890, while he was still alive, in honor of him, the largest wooden uh, uh, steamboat on the Great Lakes was built. I don't know where it was built here at Sturgeon Bay or where, I'm not really sure, but it called the Fred Pabst in honor of this mariner brewer. And the Fred Pabst uh, didn't uh, last very long, you can see only from 1890 to 1907. What often happened with these steamers is after they proved to be not real seaworthy or kind of old, they'd actually convert them into barges and they would pull them behind other steamboats or even sometimes behind schooners. So that happened also to the Fred Paps. Uh, it became a barge and eventually uh, it uh, was in an accident uh, with another ship and, and sunk. So, Frederick Pabst Mariner. You read this artic article about him. He was essentially a self-made man of well-developed physique, capable of undergoing much manual labor, practical in all his views, ardent in his temperament, self-reliant and energetic. He could scarcely fail of success in any enterprises he would undertake. He is a man of warm friendships and social habits, is happy himself, and endeavors to diffuse happiness around him. Now, when we think of captains, there had to be some mean captains out there, like Dan Seavey. <laughs> so we know about that. A mean, cussing, nasty cap, uh, captains. I'm sure there were, but Everything I read about Frederick Pabst is that he was a, just the kindest man ever, just considered of uh, women, children, and uh, obviously he was a captain that people followed, literally. If they were taking a, a steamboat, they would check out first to see whether they could go on one captain by Frederick Pabst. And this was true when he was uh, a, uh, a maker of beer. He literally knew the first name of every single employee in his brewery. And he was extremely generous to the city of Milwaukee. Uh, just uh, unbelievably kind, humble man in spite of his wealth and his prominence. So Great Lakes captain, beer bearer, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and art collector. I showed you uh, one of his pieces of art. This one's called Farewell to the Homeland. And I'm sure he purchased this because even though he was only 12 years old when he came to America, this picture had to remind him of the grief that he must have felt among him, around him. Because these people were leaving relatives they would probably never ever see again in their whole lives. They were leaving a, a lifestyle they would never again live. It was pretty much permanent. So you see them huddled together one with his arms out. But I find it interesting, the only people that seem happy and are facing forward are these two guys drinking beer. <laughs> we'll figure. Uh, he's, he collected a lot of different art. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, yes. I was gonna ask you who did the painting that you just showed. <laughs> Never mind. I'm 
I'm not sure I could find out, but I do not go off here. Uh, this one, frigates off the of uh, Norwegian coast, another seascape, because he, he surrounded himself with, uh, with the sea, his, his love for the sea. Interesting, and again, this, by the way, is the vault of the Paps Mansion on the left-hand side. It's taller than I am. The vault where they kept their sterling silver and their jewelry and gold and stocks and bonds and whatnot um, in the butler's pantry. And when it came time to choose the artwork, he could have chosen lots of different things. You know, a bottle of beer, a stein of beer, a beer barrel. How about the comet, uh, whatever? Well, he came close. He chose a steamboat. It's, uh, it's actually more like a Mississippi River steamboat, but you get the idea. He always felt, you know, although he's not here to tell us that's true, but it, that, that it was his greatest accomplishment at age uh, 21 to be responsible for a steamboat and all of its, all of its contents. Pretty amazing. Now, I told you he invested his money in, uh, in real estate here are some of the places. This on the upper left-hand corner is actually Times Square in New York City. The first building at Times Square was not the Times Building. It was the Paps Building. So next New Year's Eve, when they're celebrating, they should be saying they're celebrating in Paps Square. This is the Paps Building in downtown Milwaukee, the first skyscraper. This, of course, the Paps Mansion. Uh, this is uh, one of his many restaurants the Paps Brewery grounds. And uh, did he build the pyramids too? <laughs> What's that doing in this picture? Well, check it out. Paps beer. What they would do in winter to get away from, believe it or not, our nasty weather here in Wisconsin is take grand tours of Europe. So he had been to the, see the pyramids of Giza and the, the canals of Venice and the Victoria Falls and, and so forth. And I just put this picture in just to remind us uh, that uh, he uh, did a lot of traveling as well. So he died when he was uh, 67 years old, which was pretty good in those days when the average uh, uh, lifespan for a man was about 55 or so. But he had a lot of uh, problems. He had. Uh, emphysema, he had uh, heart disease, he had some strokes, and he died the first day of January in 1904, very first day of January. When he was quite old, uh, near, near his death, a reporter came up to him and said, Captain Paps, if you could be anywhere in the world right now, exactly where would you want to be? Exactly where would you want to be? Uh, again, I just talked about they've been all over the world uh, on these trips. You must have had some favorite places. You know, we all do, right? He thought about it only for just a short amount of time. And he responded this way. I wish I were on board a steamer. That was his answer. This man that we know, most people know as a beer baron. Uh-uh. He wished he were born a steamer. The end. So I'll gladly take any questions. Yes. Does the captain get to choose his vessel? I'm not sure, you know, if that was the case. I would, I would guess that if he proved to be a really uh, superior captain, um, he probably would have some choice when they were changing routes or, or bringing in new boats. I, I wouldn't think that he would be uh, near the top of the list in the Goodrich line. Just the very fact that uh, he, he sailed on so many different boats. But with the comet, I know that he did have partial love, uh, interest, he partially owned, partially owned the comet. Yes. Uh, was he able to save up enough money from his time as a captain to actually buy the half of his father in law's brewery, or did the money come from other areas as well? Well, there was no other source at that time, but he slowly bought, bought more and more stocks. Also, over time. 
over over a period of time. Yes, right. It didn't just happen overnight by, by any means. Yes. A friend of mine who's followed all the history of Washington Island. Yes. Wanted me to ask you somewhere along the line in this discussions with his father. His father said that Paps had a carriage and used to pick people up with his carriage. And the guy driving the carriage had a top hat, yeah, like yes. a baller uniform. Yes. Did you ever run across anything about I have carriage? a photograph of that somewhere I could probably pull up for you, but that is absolutely true. They call it a tally hole. Uh, the one that I saw, which was almost like a stagecoach yeah. on wheels. And uh, there's a picture of one right in front of the Paps Mansion. So he did own that. Well, here's, here's an interesting thing, too. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt came to Milwaukee on a uh, campaign trip. And while he was here, he uh, met Captain Pabst. And the captain offered him his, his, his finest carriage. And so that uh, carriage and the, uh, the carriage person, whatever you, driver, took him all around Milwaukee uh, while he was here. And then, of course, invited him to the Paps Mansion for dinner later on. So he did actually. Uh, Any idea yes. that carriage is still around? Uh, I, I, it is. It's uh, owned by the, by the uh, Milwaukee County Historical Society. And it's in storage in a uh, one of their warehouses. It's too big to normally have out uh, in their their museum, but at least one of their carriages is still around. Yeah, they'd have uh, what they call livery. You know, uh, the uh, people that also were with the carriage, all dressed up in the leather colors of the family. But interestingly, he he wasn't normally a man that showed off his wealth. Now, there were over 60 other mansions along Grand Avenue at the time that he built his residence, some twice the size of his, 20,000 square feet. And uh, he actually wasn't one to uh, draw attention to his house or have you know huge crazy parties there like some of the others did. Uh, so he always kept his humility, but uh, also his his big heart. Yeah. So I was wondering, several of the pictures you had mentioned that they have music on these ships. Was this classical music or polka bands or what? <laughs> Probably just a fiddle, <laughs> or maybe an accordion. Uh, um, I don't think they had any. No, they, I don't think they really had large bands on there. I would guess. Uh, the space was too valuable for the ship shipping line to waste it for a band. They could probably squeeze a few more passengers in there or a few more uh, barrels of beer than have a band on board. Well, Dave, one of the points that you, that you pointed out when we were on our tour in Milwaukee was that even though this was a very brief period of his life, for the rest of his life, he always preferred to be referred to as Captain, yes. Thank you for mentioning that. I, I wanted to along the way, and I, keep, I kept on looking for the right place to do it. Yes, all of his life, uh, not Mr. Pabst or Herr Pabst, as the Germans might say, he always wanted to be addressed as Captain Pabst, even though he was a, a brewer. So there again is pretty, a, a good example of what those days as a mariner really meant to him. I, I firmly believe that if he would have listed his accomplishments in life, that would have been right, right at the top. I mean, he said he wanted to be a uh, steamer. Yes. What well, do you see in the picture on the right? It looks like that's the age he would be when he was an actual captain, but he's really. Just... Isn't that a great photograph? <laughs> you know, there is no photograph of him as a captain, but this one so closely resembled him. That I thought I'd use it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because that was the era of Robert Barons, what they called Robert Barons. Yes. It sounds like due to his personality, he wasn't going to talk about Rockefeller. These guys were ruthless. Right. And you think this man was very kind and generous, with, so he wasn't really classified as a robber baron? No, not by at all. No. No, he, uh, 
although he did buy a lot of the other breweries, there were at the time um, he started brewing beer, there probably were over 60 breweries in Milwaukee. Oh. A lot of them very small and, and the big names, uh, uh, Eli, which is Schlitz and Blatz, another big one, Pabst, uh, did buy up a lot of those smaller brewers and, and you know, com- consolidate things. But they weren't, they weren't ruthless in doing it. They didn't uh, drive them out of, out of business as uh, the robber barons did. They were fair and uh, gave them a good price and probably kept on a lot of the uh, managers in those brewers, breweries. So there's no, there's no comparing them at all. And uh, the it's city of Milwaukee. how much wealth is accumulated. It's a short life span. Yeah. Yes. Uh, of course, those are the days before income tax. <laughs> <laughs> that would help all of us, right? We'd all, all be just a little wealthy. <laughs> Do we have any questions online? No, I have not got any. Okay, I've got two questions. Um, the first one is What is your favorite feature of the Pabst Mansion? Well, I'd have to say it would be his study. And uh, his study is on the first floor. It's done, when you walk into it, you feel like you're in a castle in Europe. All the woodwork is beautifully carved oak with walnut inlays. Uh, It was already antiqued when the house was built. It has 14 secret compartments in it. It's got a beautifully hand-painted ceiling with German script. Uh, It's got Rondell windows, which were typical of uh, of castles in Europe. So it's very uh, much uh, old German in style. And it was a place of solace and refuge for him too. He had his office in the brewery. If you tour uh, uh, the uh, best place it's called today, you can see his office and his big roll top desk and so forth. But he did have keep a desk in, in his office for correspondence. And it, it was a place uh, to uh, smoke his cigars. And when they entertained, the ladies would be invited to Mrs. Papp's parlor, while the men would be invited into into Captain's study. Um, um, Study? It's not the right word. His uh, his, 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 uh, yeah, his room, whatever. And uh, they would have smoked cigars, Cuban cigars. And have cognac and whiskey and scotch and brandy. And I always say on my tours, now who do you think was having more fun? The women <laughs> drinking coffee, that's what they did, and the guys that were in uh, Kevin Papp's study. Yeah. So that probably is my favorite room. It, it was uh, the very first time I toured as a visitor, and I still I still like that room most. Do you have any chairs? We've identified over 250 direct descendants of the Pabst family worldwide, and uh, many of them still live in Germany. We have some living in the Milwaukee area. We have several on our board of directors, and uh, there are quite a few in California because of their adopted granddaughter eventually living out there. But anyway, several summers ago, we invited all 250 of them to Milwaukee for a family reunion and over 100 showed up. They had a picnic, a beer garden on the lawn and they toured the house. And here's the thing, these people, great, 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 great descendants of the original perhaps, they couldn't believe how the uh, ancestral home had been kept up as well as it has been. It really is quite remarkable that that house has stayed the way it is because all the others were lost. So they were just very, very pleased. They, they loved the tour, they loved the house. And the benefit that we received from it was they are very generous in returning things to the house that were passed down generation to generation. They're, they said, it really belongs back in the Pabst branch. So we're gonna return it there as well. Um, yes. You mentioned he was an art collector. Is there a lot of art? There is. Uh, the walls are filled with just all kinds of art, landscapes, seascapes, social scenes, uh, 
And uh, part of it is from the uh, Blatz family. There are some of their collection hangs there as well. But remember, he had art not only in his house, he had it in his restaurants. So he bought a lot of art. What they would do is they hired a number of people to watch for art that they knew they liked. And also when they were traveling in, in, in Europe or the grand tours, the Victorians, when they went through some of these old homes, they say, oh, I like that table. I'll buy it, bring it up and send it home. Oh, that vase is really nice. Is that for sale? I want that. And they, so they packed their house with uh, antiquities. Nasty. Any other questions? Yes. When I looked at the Pabst Museum, I was impressed with the communication system where they had like tubes from one room to another. And supposedly, people upstairs could talk to the people in the lower level where the servants were. You know, to, start, to start with, they had just a speaker tube on each floor, which was a hole in the wall in the front of the house connected with the tube to a hole in the wall in the servants' dining room. And you can imagine in a house that's 20,000 square feet, you'd have to really shout to be able to heard, be heard through those tubes. So later on, they put in 24 switches, which were connected to an annunciator box or a bell box, like a Downton Abbey. Every switch had an arrow that was labeled, and there was a bell. So when the switch was switched, that particular arrow would point up, or the bell would ring first, the arrow would point up where you know exactly where the origin of the call was. And that was put in place maybe four or five years after the house was built. Anyone else? Well, I thank you so much for the honor. Okay. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will uh, our, we take the summer off with our Maritime Speaker Series, but we will be back um, starting in October, the first Thursday in October, October through May. So we hope we'll all see you back. Have a wonderful summer season. And uh, anybody needs a PBR for the road? Yes, please <laughs> bring the PBR. Awesome. And also,